Welcome to our second video and the third layer of our Python abstraction pyramid. If you think of chapter two as our four layer Python pyramid that's based on detail, then the fully detailed individual how and why lessons would make up the base. The verb topics, connections, and mnemonics without all of the details that we covered in the last video would make up the second layer. And now abstracting even further in this video, we're gonna focus on the third level, which covers the generalized groupings of each section. Our goal here is to avoid the details and look at the general commonalities that the sections share. So let's pull back even more and review the forest, not the trees. Now the first section in this chapter was the operators, and there were so many of them that we made the learning objectives just to understand what some of the big groupings are and some of the most common actions that they represent. And this was the first time we really started to change the variables that we learned about in the first section. As you begin programming a lot, operators become so ubiquitous with just the fact of writing that you won't even notice them after a while because it's the primary tool that we're using that connects one type of information to another. Whether it's arithmetic or it's comparison or it's assignment, this is the landscape, this is the events that unfold to our character, the variable. So the big takeaway from this section is that the more of these that you get familiar with, the more that you have memorized, basically the better coder you are. It means you can handle more situations. You can, you can manipulate data in ways that solve more problems. Our next section was conditionals. What we needed to do was put some context into the environment so we knew what operator is best to use based on what situation we're in. So the overall objective was to learn how and when to create conditions that will trigger the right operations that we learned from the last section. Which times are appropriate to change which types of variables. Now conditionals are pretty simple. There's only three keywords that we really need to understand, but this is where practice comes in. It's not about memorizing the three keywords. It's about knowing the right situations to use those keywords in. And our next section was all about recurrence. And when we really start to dive into the meat of this topic, we found a whole bunch of different ways to automate over several of the group types. And this is really where computers shine. You can start dealing with data sets that are above what humans can. This gave us the power to apply conditionals and operations to groups of any size. Need 100,000 numbers multiplied? Not a problem. A million, 10 million? Very powerful to understand how recurrence and iteration and iterative objects all work together. Now, one of the primary and most basic ways to work with these kind of problems is by creating loops. We know that there were several types of loops. There's while loops and there's for loops. But the main point is that we can think of these as a conveyor belt where each of the items inside of our group types are coming by. And then we can define the logic that we want to apply to each element. This is really the first time that we started to scale a problem. Now you're starting to have the tools to automate something that you might want to do, but is just boring or too difficult in your own life. You're starting to be able to write your own scripts. Go out there and scrape jokes off a website, for example, like we'll do in my next course. Or go out there and look through a database, search a database. Things like that are all starting to become possible. And then our final section was all about functions. Of course, I called these the granddaddy of all concepts in Python, but they are extremely important. And in fact, right from the beginning, whenever we use some kind of keyword with parentheses, we were using a function, but it was a little too early to discuss that. But now that we're here, you can see that inside of those little parentheses, you can pass variables that can go into an infinite amount of logic. And inside that logic can be more functions. And that rabbit hole never really ends. My goal for this section was just to drill in how powerful these functions really can be. It's amazing that they can bring in their namespaces, they can contain variables, that they can be pushed into other variables through parameters. And when you start getting your head around all of this power, you start seeing a whole lot of things that you can build. And then when you start dealing with APIs like Twitter and Facebook APIs, you're just going to have to use the function calls. You don't have to worry about all of the complex information that's actually being processed. And also from a community point of view, functions are a really powerful way to understand all of the work that other programmers have already done. Python being an open source programming language that's well supported by a community, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. There are so many functions underneath everything that we do that have been perfected and tweaked and built on top of even lower level functions that we really can do a lot of stuff with not that much effort. So we should probably take a minute to just stand in awe of how much we really can do with so few lines of code. You standing in awe? 
Okay, so now let's head back over to our Auto Shop class and start looking at how some of these great sections around verbs fit into real-world Python projects.